Dr. Sindhu, we can we, we can start the session. Yes, sir, can uh, you are able to visual visual, sir? Yeah. My screen. Yes, sir. Okay. Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Sindhu, uh, consultant neonatologist at Butterfly Women's and Children's Hospital. Uh, today we are going to discuss about neonatal sepsis, which is a global burden in all the neonatal units all over the world. Neonatal sepsis, it's a systemic condition that arises from the bacterial, viral, or fungal origin, which is associated with the hemodynamic changes associated with the clinical findings, which causing a severe morbidity and mortality. When we come with a global burden, why are we stressing so much on sepsis, sepsis in every neonatal unit and concentrating 70% uh, of our major concentrate in any of the neonatal unit is sepsis? Why? Because it causes a major morbidity and mortality. When we come with a global burden, uh, it's a third leading cause of neonatal mortality and it constitutes about 13% of overall global neonatal mortality. In high income countries, sepsis mortality rate is around 5 to 20% and the disability rate around uh, uh, ranges about causing the major disability in about 40% of cases, even after a conventional treatment. Uh, according to a recent uh, uh, article published in BMJ, the neonatal sepsis incidence was 2824 a decade before uh, out of 1 lakh live births, estimated to be around 17.6%. In the last decade, that is 2009 to 2018, the incidence increased up to 3,930 3, as per the 1 lakh live births. So it ranges around 95% of confidence interval. So mortality rated up, uh, increased about 70% in, in some low and middle income countries. In overall estimated, the incidence is and mortality, both are high in early onset sepsis compared to the late onset sepsis. When we come to our country, the famous Delhi neonatal infection study shows that the incidence of sepsis in our country ranges for about 14.3%, in which culture positive sepsis is 6.2%. In 6.2% of culture positive sepsis, the case fatality rate is 25.6%. And of which 25.6%, the culture positive was 47%. It means that 50% of culture positive sepsis had a high fatality rate. Nearly two thirds of the total episodes occurred in around 72 hours of life. It's the same as in global incidence, that is the early onset sepsis has high incidence compared to the late onset sepsis, even in our country. Next goes with the sepsis. Next goes to the route of transmission. Uh, as we all know, sepsis, uh, neonatal sepsis is divided into two things. That is early onset and late onset. So what is early onset sepsis? Sepsis which arises within 72 hours of life is early onset sepsis. Why? This comes with like, it's a more of vertical transmission. That is in utero or it is, either it is a in utero transmission or through the hematogenous spread or through the amniotic fluid or through during the birth. So within any 72 hours, we call it as an early onset sepsis slash vertical transmission. Next to go with the horizontal transmission. So okay. sepsis. Yeah, you can uh, unmute yourself, Dr. Sindhu. I think I have by mistake muted you. Thank you. Sir. So um, next, late onset sepsis. So late onset sepsis, we know that it's in horizontal transmissions, more acquired, more common in hospital acquired infections, majority being the late onset sepsis. We have a breach between the vertical and horizontal sepsis, that vertical and horizontal transmission, that is, uh, when we are uh, doing a resuscitation, there is an aseptic condition when we start a resuscitation and continue a resuscitation in an aseptic conditions that is within 72 hours. Then this shows that this comes under uh, early onset sepsis, though this is, uh, a, this is an horizontal transmission, we label it as an uh, early onset sepsis. Convenience. Yeah, please continue. Yes. Sir. 
Dr. Charan, please uh, do not put any marks on the screen. And Dr. Sindhu, if it is not moving in this way, you Sir. can uh, you can minimize in the screen format which is chosen by you right now, and you can continue on this screen. No worries. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, after the roads of transmission, so now we have understood regarding the early onset sepsis, how it is going to be transmitted to the baby and late onset sepsis, how it's going to be transmitted to the baby. Next comes to the nomenclature. This, there are different nomenclature labeling the sepsis. The most common are probable sepsis. Probable sepsis is both clinical and laboratory findings suggestive of infection, but the blood culture is sterile. Then we call this, it could be a probable of sepsis because sepsis screen is positive and the clinical findings are also suggestive. This is the most common because most of our blood cultures doesn't exactly show the culture positivity. So we could label it as the probable sepsis. Next, clinical sepsis. Clinically, the baby looks septic, like sepsis, but septic screen and blood culture are sterile. Both are sterile. Then we call label it as a clinical sepsis. Definitive sepsis, yes, we have already known that it's a culture positive. Then we label it as a definitive sepsis. And finally, it is suspected sepsis, where most of us get confused. Here, the suspicion of the sepsis comes only the risk factors. It's based upon the risk factors and clinical features. But the clinical codes, which we are expected to be the to see in the baby, and the screening tests are not suggestive of sepsis, then we should label this as a suspected sepsis. This is more likely to rule out the sepsis than the rule in the sepsis. So we suspect sepsis based upon the risk factors and the clinical features, which we are going to discuss in the further slides. But, uh, but the screening tests are not suggestive and we should not label this as a suspected. It's more about the rule out and ruling out the sepsis than the ruling the sepsis. Next, and bacterial profile. What are the most common organisms? It compared to the Western countries where the where we keep on talking about GBS, GBS, our country profile where the recent Denny study has proved that GBS is in the last of our, uh, um, when we put our profile, it comes in the last. So most of the more than two third are gram negative organisms of which acetobacter species uh, last about 22% than with the Klebsiella than E. coli. Acetobacter, we have already would have seen all of us in a clinical practice. Most of our cultures in an NICU will be acetobacter. Why is acetobacter disturbing us so much and causing so much of uh, expansion in our NICU? Is its selection pressure by broad spectrum antibiotics is high. So the clonal expansion of this is high. So this property might, might lead to might have led to uh, more proliferation and subsequent dominance in our country. After this, uh, this there is a mix in both. This uh, when we should clearly see that both in early onset sepsis and late onset sepsis there is no difference in the bacterial profile. It is the same Acinobacter and Klebsiella and E. coli, which is predominant of all the sepsis which is gram-negative organisms are more predominant than the gram-positive organisms. In gram-positive, if it comes to the gram-positive uh, gram pathogens, where cons is a major, that is coagulation negative cephalococcus is a major, next with the cephalorius, then with the enterococcus species. Gram-negative pathogens, as I've already told you, which is higher than that of the gram-positive. That is 59% of the gram-negative versus 33% in the gram-positive organisms. So in our country, it's maybe due to the um, prophylactic changes in the, or due to the performer changes in the maternal uh, birth tract, or due to uh, where we can't isolate, where we are not able to isolate the group B streptococci, or in the uh, use of antibiotics is profound in maternal as well as neonatal. The group B streptococcus is in the last in our profile. Neonates with infected with pseudomonas species has the highest fatality rate. So, multi drug resistance bacteria is the same as the incidence. The drug resistance is higher in Acinobacter, next with the Klebsiella, next with the E. coli. When it comes to gram-positive organisms, methicillin resistant are more prevalent, about 61% of cons than compared to the 38% in Staphylococcus aureus. So cons are more of methicillin resistant where than compared with the Staph aureus. So we have discussed about the what is the origin, how it is going to be transmitted, then uh, what is the bacterial profile in our country, then what are the signs and symptoms. 
the non specific symptoms all every baby present with the same symptoms whatever could be the diagnosis that is lethargy poor feeding fever hypothermia vomiting diarrhea abdominal distensions so whatever could be the seeing the, the symptoms will be the all these are non specific symptoms like seizure and cephalopathy so even if you can if you think about iems or even if you think about um, any other rds all this will be like instances it will be more of the same symptoms like lethargy poor feeding hypothermia vomiting seizure and cephalopathy and all system specific here we can differentiate where is the uh, origin of the sepsis like if uh, there is an a high pitched cry or in, incessant cry with uh, seizure and all we can think of more going towards the uh, meningitis when there is an hypotension and poor perfusion cardiac origin and uh, acute renal failure in, in renal as symptoms is a acute renal failure hematologically there will be a bleeding petechiae in case of dic purpurae skin changes like multiple pustules sclerema where is the um, and mottling of the skin umbilical redness all this will be the skin changes when we go with the evidence what is the most common symptoms symptom uh, for the uh, baby or a sign we can see in the first 6 days is most prevalent symptom is um, we can see here it is an tachypnea and the fever tachypnea that is respiratory distress and tachypnea and fever are the prevail are the most two prevalence of the uh, symptoms in first 6 days of babies whereas when compared to the 7 to 9 59 days most common sign is fever next most common comes with the um, uh, his birth asphyxia that is baby did not cry at birth and next common symptom would be is uh, nasal flaring that is respiratory distress so when compared to the first 6 days and the next 7 to 59 days first 6 is the most common is tachypnea and the fever whereas when compared to 7 to 59 days where the most common symptoms could be birth asphyxia along with it is uh, respiratory distress so the young infant clinical sign study group has uh, shown the uh, independent clinical predictors for severity of illness occurring in 0 to 6 days age group each the most common symptoms is shock that is either the baby will will be having a signs of shock like convulsions or uh, baby will be delayed after refilling time and prolonged refilling time or uh, temperature instability difficulty in feeding all these things will constitute the high incidence of the uh, illness severity of the illness which require for hospital admissions investigations septic screen septic screen Se uh, septic screen is uh, the main five the components of the septic, septic screen is total leukocyte count absolutely neutrophil count immature to total neutrophils micro esr and c-react to protein of this five uh, total leukocyte count leukocytosis uh, leukopenia is more uh, towards sepsis compared to the leukocytosis because leukocytosis can be positive any of the babies like the baby is having a incessant cry from the past 3 uh, to 4 hours there will be leukocytosis any signs of inflammation there will be a uh, signs of uh, increase in leukocyte count even if there is maternal a uh, flora or maternal inflammation carried towards the baby there will be a high leukocytic count so leukopenia is more towards the uh, neonatal sepsis compared to the leukocytosis that is tlc count less than 5000 absolute neutrophil count that is less than 1800 this can easily plotted in our charts munro chart in term babies and muzino chart in preterm babies mature to total neutrophil count this is the percentage is more than 20% in preterm babies and more than 27% in term babies is abnormal micro esr uh, that is 3 plus age in days after day 1 of life is considered as an abnormal and c reactive protein we all know it's more than 10 mg per dl is taken as a positivity uh, c reactive protein the sensitivity uh, and the negative predictive value the two crps are uh, uh, crps are negative the negative predictive value will be around 95 to 100% that is If the two CRPs are consecutive, CRPs are negative. It means that we have ruled out, but there is no sepsis for that baby. That negative predictive value is almost ninety-five to hundred percent in that baby. So when we come to the septic screen investigations, two abnormal parameters. Out of these five, if there are two abnormal parameters in the screen, is associated with sensitivity of ninety-three to hundred percent and specificity of eighty-three percent with the negative predictive value of hundred percent. So the two abnormal pa parameters for the screen were. uh so there is 100% of negative predictive value if two parameters are abnormal it should be considered as a positive screen and the neonate should be started on antibiotics if the screen is negative so we have we have sent a screen 
where, where there is two parameters are abnormal, positive screen we can, should consider and start on antibiotics. If the screen is negative completely, then even this clinical suspension is persisting till the tachypnea is persisting, till the baby is lethargic, till there is no improvement in the clinical status. So repeat the septic screen after 12 hours. If the still is negative the septic screen, then exclude the sepsis and think, think about the other duties, which is causing the symptoms. So, so here we should have a clear picture that if the screen, septic screen is uh, negative, but still, still we have a clinical suspicion of the sepsis, repeat the screen after 12 hours. So that, that makes uh, a bit clarity for the sepsis and to rule out the other duties. So other, other investigations, we know chest X-ray to rule out pneumonia. If there is suspecting of abdominal distension and necrotizing enterocolitis, get an abdominal X-ray. And uh, urine culture to be done. Urine culture have a low yield and are not in, indicated routinely. Usually we don't uh, send urine culture. Uh, so if there is a urine culture, if you are taking and suspecting of UTI occurs, if there is more than 10 WBC per cubic mm in 10 ml of centrifuge sample or 10 to the power of 5 in per ml in urine obtained by a catheterization or any organisms obtained by suprapubic aspiration is considered as an UTI. Next, early onset sepsis. Early onset sepsis, clearly we should... Um, so before getting a clear picture of early onset septic, let us discuss on risk factors. There are two kinds of risk, fact risk factors. One is perinatal risk factors, which are normal, then extreme risk factors. Perinatal risk factors are six. They are a rupture of membrane that is more than 24 hours, spontaneous preterm labor, chorioamnitis, prolonged labor, that is stage one and stage two labor for more than 24 hours, single unclean or more than three sterile per vaginal examinations and perinatal asphyxia. These are the six risk factors included, out of which extreme risk factors are chorioamnitis, that is intra-amniotic infection. What is intra-amniotic infection and inflammation? This, is, this includes maternal fever, that is maternal temperature more than 100, and in case of, we should divide into two things, confirmed AAA, that is intra-amniotic infection and inflammation, confirmed AAA, that is intra-amniotic infection and inflammation, it is confirmed. When should we suspect that is an intra-amniotic infection and inflammation is the basal fetal tachycardia is more than 160 beats per minute for more than 10 minutes, whereas maternal leukocyte count is more than 15,000 in the absence of corticosteroids and definitive there is a purulent fluid from the cervical loss. Is the only suspension of uh, chorioamnitis. Whereas uh, confirmed is there's a positive amniotic fluid gram strain culture, which is very, very rare, we does in our country. And next thing is histopathological evidence of infection and inflammation in both or both in placenta. If you take a placenta sample and send for a histopathological in evidence, if there is then signs of inflammation in that placenta, then you should have a confirmed triple I. So next we have discussed about the risk factors and signs and symptoms. Uh, till now, we got into a theory. Next, go with the practically. See, baby A, it's a preterm baby. That's a 32 plus 3 week male delivered um, by LSES in view of maternal eclampsia prior to a primary mother by second degree consanguineous marriage. Abgas were normal. Baby cried immediately after that. Do we start antibiotics for this baby? How do we approach for this baby? Next. Next, uh, just keep in mind, I will be discussing later on about these babies again. That time you'll get a clarity. You should be able to answer these babies when we go, complete our sessions. Baby B, it's a late preterm, 36 weeker male baby delivered to a primary mother uh, by normal vaginal delivery with a birth weight of 2.12 kg with PPROM of for 26 hours. With no antenatal risk factors, baby cried after birth and abgas were normal. Last baby, baby C, it's a term baby delivered by LSU in of oligohydromnes with PROM for 24 hours and history of maternal fever 20 hours before delivery. Baby cried immediately after birth. Abgas were normal, but baby had tachypnea. So these three babies we will be discussing later after the session. So you should be able to like whom to approach, uh, how to approach. Next, approach to unit. So uh, approach to unit with suspected early onset sepsis. How do we approach? So uh, of all, after, after completing of my session, you should be able to carry on at least one point that is, there is no rational if to perform septic screen in suspected EOS. There is no role of septic screen in suspected EOS. The negative predictive value for various septic screen in our, in our uh, panel, there is six panels, five panels, which we have discussed the uh, screens, where having 
very very low threshold to rule out sepsis so this negative predictive value is very very low so in case of you are suspecting sepsis uh, the septic screen has no role and it's more about a rule out of sepsis than compared with a rule in sepsis so procalcitonin interleukin 6 are more promising standards but yet to come to our bedside so early onset sepsis we are discussing in two categories there is symptomatic neonates and asymptomatic neonates symptomatic neonates neonates who turn symptomatic within 72 hours must be clinically assessed for a probability of sepsis symptomatic neonates with any of the risk factors or who have a chest x-ray suggestive of pneumonia or do not have any other explanation of the signs so must immediately start an antibody so they are symptomatic if a baby ex baby baby is having uh, excess issue of pneumonia and baby is having uh, risk factors then you need immediately start on antibiotics after drawing a blood culture if there are no risk second category if there are no risk factors and the chest x ray is no pneumonic changes but the baby is symptomatic like if the baby is having tachypnea then seek for the alternative explanation like baby is having tachypnea then think about ttnb or think about rds if it's a preterm baby even in term babies can have rds so if there are no risk factors still the chest x ray is there showing some uh, chest x ray is not showing any pneumonic changes but the baby is symptomatic then alternate explanations should be uh, seen and next thing is observe the baby closely close vigilance to the baby is very 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 important no risk factors chest x ray is no pneumonic baby is symptomatic please don't neglect it of like yes there is no symptomatic no pneumonic changes okay this is not sepsis no please observe the baby even even it could be sepsis which is presenting later but observe the baby clinically very very close monitoring is necessary for this kind of babies lumbar puncture uh, is necessary to for the csf examination for all symptomatic neonates if other than the who are where, where we have ruled out it is not a sepsis uh, where we have a clear explanation regarding any other things like ttnb and rds which is not necessary but where symptomatic neonates we have an explanation towards the sepsis then definitely we need to do a lumbar puncture the duration of lumbar puncture should not be based upon septic screen not the blood culture if there are the baby is symptomatic and we have a clear uh, uh, clear understanding towards the, seps the sepsis then go with a lumbar puncture definitely we don't wait till the blood culture comes or till the septic screen is uh, results are out in case of asymptomatic neonates this is very easy asymptomatic neonates with the presence of risk factors for sepsis yes all neonates less than 35 weeks of gestation asymptomatic neonate should be evaluated for the risk factors as we have already discussed risk factors should be there for sepsis then evaluate if the risk factors are there yes evaluating is one of the risk factors score or one thing is there is clinical risk factors which we have already seen or next thing is we have a scoring system for the babies where this the we, we, when we go to the google and press like neonatal septic calculator you will get a septic calculator in that you can easily see what is the risk for the uis for this baby based upon the gestational age weight and based upon the uh, with gestational age weight and based upon the incidence of the sepsis in your unit the septic screen they will calculate the septic calculator will calculate the risk of the uis for this kind of baby then we can take a call on starting our antibiotics or waiting for it so two things if there is baby is asymptomatic one is clinically assess about the risk factors and take a call on it or the second thing is based upon the uh, risk calculator so what is the drawback this list this calculator is maternal issues are not when we go back to the google and see there is no maternal antibiotics uh, column in that so where we should clean, we should uh, definitely think about maternal antibiotics when we suspecting of sepsis in eos and uh, the baby is having um, this is a multiple variable analysis was not performed in it or native weightage has allotted arbitrarily which is like random so when we go with the clinical suspensions uh, and uh, with the investigations when to start antibiotics in babies with an one extreme risk factor that is chorioamnitis or with three or more risk factors or clinical indicators then start on antibiotics for sending after sending of blood culture so three or more risk factors or one extreme risk factor that is chorioamnitis say start antibiotics send blood culture in babies with two risk factors then set, send septic screen start uh, start antibiotics if the septic screen is positive in case of suspension sepsis screen can be repeated after 12 hours as we have already discussed so approach to the so till now we have approach to the uis next comes the approach to the los in los we have two things one is low probability and high probability of sepsis perform a septic screen in units with low probability of her sepsis if all the parameters of the septic screen are negative antibiotics may not may not to be started and the neonate must be closely monitored in case of a low probability sepsis in case of a high probability sepsis 
instead of the neuron should be directly started you no need to wait for the septic screen nor the anything directly start so based upon the symptoms the l voice is divided into low probability and high probability low probability wait send the septic screen uh, then if the septic screen is positive or the septic screen is negative don't start antibiotics septic screen is positive think about it and start on antibiotics in case of high probability for sepsis instead of this should be directly started on antibiotics the negative repeat screen uh, strongly indicates again starting antibiotics whereas a positive repeat screen with presence of symptoms may wants to start antibiotic so here comes back to the so after discussing about the risk factors after discussing about the clinical risk factors and the septic screen and how to approach early onset and late onset let us discuss baby a this is the same baby it's a preterm baby with 1.5 kg male baby delivered to a primary mother second degree consanguineous marriage lscs with abgars of 7 and 8 do we start antibiotics the thing is no even it is a preterm baby even it is an uh, 1.5 kg baby with no risk factors and baby no asymptomatic no need to start antibiotics next baby b late preterm male baby delivered to a primary mother with by spontaneous vaginal delivery with a birth weight of 2.12 kg ppr may for 26 hours no antenatal risk factors baby cried um with one cycle of bag and mask do we start antibiotics here comes the dilemma so we have two respects one is spontaneous vaginal delivery one and pprom two respects what do we do so two risk factors what do we do so if there is two risk factors and symptoms uh, if there is two risk factors are present and symptoms are absent see for the symptoms this baby doesn't have any symptoms so look for the presence of extreme risk factors we don't have any of the extreme risk factors so none of the extreme risk factors monitor the blame baby closely when the risk factors and symptoms are both are present initiate antibiotics so this baby doesn't have any of the uh, uh, symptoms only the risk factors are present so but there there, there there is no extreme risk factors only the risk factors with no symptoms so closely monitor the baby no need to start on antibiotics baby c it's a well term baby delivered to a g2p1 l1 mother with uh, in lscs in view of oligohydrominous with a prp prom for prom for 24 hours with birth weight of 3 kg history of maternal fever for 20 fever 24 hours before delivery baby cried baby is having tachycardia so single risk factor extreme risk factor that is maternal fever which we have already discussed is showing then do we start antibiotic yes single risk factor with the symptoms no need to think about it also we need to start on antibiotics after sending blood culture hope uh, uh, you people understand the eui's approach to summarize it so less than 60 72 hours early onset sepsis look at the presence of risk factors and the symptoms risk factors are present symptoms are absent look for the extreme risk factors there are any one of the extreme risk factors initiate antibiotics none of the extreme risk factors monitor the baby closely risk factors and symptoms both present then start on antibiotics no risk factors and symptoms present no risk factors but symptoms are present then look the severity of the neonatal symptoms neonate is sick and strong clinical suspension initiate initiate antibiotics neonate is not too sick and it's only single episode of apnea or single episode of feed intolerance then send septic screen if it is positive go with the blood culture if it is negative then stop antibiotics that's it uh, so next we'll continue with the investigations that is blood culture blood culture from the beginning of our uh, second year we will keep on reading blood culture it's a gold standard for sepsis so it's a gold standard yes till now it's a gold standard one uh, so we should remember few things for sending of the blood culture number one collection of the blood culture while we are collecting the blood sample we should never take the, from the inwelling lines or catheters which will be more likely to get contaminated culture should be taken always from a fresh veni puncture site number two one ml of sample clearly one ml of sample to be sent into a culture bottle containing about 5 to 10 ml of broth so in re, in blood culture what is the recent thing in blood culture though it's a gold standard um in earlier periods this to get a blood culture report it's around 5 to 6 days to wait and think to stop antibiotics or not but with advances we have now is a, a bd backtech automated blood culture system based upon the fluorescent technology with the growth is seen within 24 to 48 hours so lumbar puncture so uh, what is the indication for lumbar puncture we have already seen any uh, all babies evaluating for the 
late onset sepsis lumbar puncture to be sun any all blood culture positive cases and worse even on antibiotics there is worsening of the clinical condition then we should think about uh, doing a lumbar puncture so when to do lumbar lumbar puncture uh, any any unstable unit lumbar puncture can be delayed or gram positive bacteria clear in 36 hours of appropriate therapy whereas gram negative bacteria will take a long time about 5 days when a unit with meningitis uh, in not showing any clinical refer, uh, recovery even after initiation of antibiotics and the lp can be repeated after 48 hours if there is no clinical improvement we have done a lp the suspicion of meningitis uh, the lp is normal but there is still deterioration repeat the lp after 48 hours if the lp is traumatic the csf should be sent for gram stain and culture because the uh, traumatic lp will be showing our rbc is positive increasing wbc count everything so we need to send mainly for the gram stain and culture so uh, we have performed lp and we need we no need to we should not wait for the pathologist to come and see if we do an lp in the morning waiting for the pathologist to come in the evening and check no why the question is wbc count must be performed within uh, 30 minutes of the drawing of the sample it should not be it should not be wasted it must not be uh, noted that csf wbc and glucose rapidly decrease with the time so we will get a wrong a wrong negative report if we do later there is a decrease in the wbc count will and there is glucose rapidly fall with time so either we get a false positive or the false negative result so uh, this comes in this pious result so we need to perform within 30 minutes of the collection of the lumbar lumb lumb puncture next urinary tract infection this is also one of the thing included in the sepsis urinary tract most common features of uti will be seen more on the late onset sepsis than compared with early onset so most common symptoms is failure to thrive fever vomiting then comes the irritability lethargy diarrhea sinusitis uh, so routinely urine microscope doesn't ever correlate with the um, in our clinical practice we all would have seen that urinary microscope is never correlate not never most of the time it it will not correlate with the um, culture so um, we should not ultimately take a decision on microscopy exactly we need to get a culture to be done if you have a strong suspicion towards urine cul uh, uti routine urine cultures we are not we are not going to do for all the neonates with the non specific uh, symptoms the neonate with above clinical signs or, sept or septic neonate with los who are very low birth weight and who have urotractal uh, urinary tract anomalies or who had previous or ongoing bladder catheterization or turbid urine is visible then you investigate further for the uti you uh, when we are collecting sample for the um, urine culture never ever collect from the uh, neither the bag or a free flow it should always be collected from the clean catheterized sample because neither the bag sample or free flow uh, sample will be contaminated and we'll have a diagnostic dilemma for it, uh, for us to take a call whether it is a uh, seriously urinary tract infection or it is this is an uh, due to aseptic conditions next biomarkers the recent biomarkers has evaluated so much what are the biomarkers we have uh, to do are right now are crp and pct though we have interleukin and a6 8 cell surface antigen cd64 serum amyloid a there are very 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 few uh, places where they does this in a wet site uh, crp we have already discussed uh, two values of crp when we done consequently uh, have a high negative predictive value of around 90% to rule out sepsis and procalcium will be discussed in short time into look in 6 and 8 we have these are negative values because of the they have a short half life procalcium which is the uh, now which is the currently more uh, reliable uh, septic marker is procalcium that is pct is a pro hormone produced by thyroid c cells as a precursor of calcitonin many of the pro inflammatory cytokines like interleukin 6 play a role of pathogenesis of bacterial sepsis uh, so bacterial lipopolysaccharides has been shown to be a potent inducer of procalcium release into the systemic circulation these cytokines after this lipopolysaccharide will induce the uh, to secrete procalcium this then the cytokines will al almost trigger all this interleukin 6 and 8 they will trigger the procalcium secretion from the target cells procalcium even though procalcium have a good uh, sensitivity and specificity of uh, uh, of 83 to 100 percent of sensitivity and specificity of 70 to 100 percent there is a uh, the, this start procalcium start rise around 3 to 4 hours after an endotoxin uh, release and peak about 6 hours and then remain increase for over 24 hours so when the main drawback of procalcium is procalcium increase normally in 24 to 48 hours of life due to peripartum inflammatory changes so there is no much use in case of uis it's more useful uh, useful in uh, late onset sepsis than in the early onset 
So diagnosis has been done. Next comes the management. Management is two category. Yes, antibiotics, which is a major thing. Next thing is supportive. Supportive management is very, very important uh, to decrease the mortality and morbidity of the baby. Supportive, as usually we decrease, uh, we'll discuss as a TABC, temperature. Uh, so maintain the baby nurse, the baby in thermoneutral environment uh, to avoid either hypo or hyperthermia. Proper positioning, maintain the airway. Next, uh, um, oxygen saturation should be maintained either by supporting with the CPAP or with the mechanical ventilation, depends upon the baby. Next C, which is very, very important, circulation. Initiate the IV line, start on IV fluids. Uh, the baby is in shock, give an IV bolus, volume expansions with the crystalloids and collides to be done. And inotropes, if the baby is in clear, picture of septic shock, start on inotropes. And packed cells and fresh frozen plasma, if the baby is in DIC, grow for a FFPs. And uh, any bleeding diathesis, yes, FFP should be started. Antibiotic, the major thing in sepsis. The first dose of single shot of antibiotic is decreases the mortality of the baby uh, in neonatal sepsis, almost decreases to about um, 30 to 40% decrease in mortality. The single shot, as early as possible, we should start. In antibiotic, we have two things uh, like empirical antibiotics. Uh, so uh, what are the empirical antibiotics? So, Profile of, as we have already discussed, the profile of organisms are same in EOS and LOS. So the policies, the following policies can be uh, used irrespective of whether it is an EOS or LOS. So in case of community acquired, acquired sepsis, and empirically, you can start with Ampi Genta. Um, if the evidence of staphylococcus, then go with the cloxacillin and gentamicin or ampicacin. If evidence of meningitis, add sepity. This then is an empirical thing, which we are in a community acquired sepsis, suggest show of more of ampicillin and gentamicin more of our protocols, all uh, uh, Indian protocols suggest of this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, starting of antibiotics, that is Ampi and Genta or Amica. If there is an uh, uh, evidence of staph, then go with cloxacillin and Gentamicin or Amicacin. If there is a suspicion of meningitis, add on Sifotaxin. Uh, next comes the nosocomial sepsis. That is the, it depends upon your own unit. Every newborn unit, every any NICU should have their own unit policy based upon their uh, their own bacterial growth in their unit. Every newborn unit must have own unit policy based upon their local sensitivity and specificity. Preferably choosing penicillins plus amino acid when you are choose, when you are uh, uh, preparing for a pro, pro form or, or policy for your unit. Think about preferably it has to be penicillins and plus with the amino acid combination. And syphilis parents rapidly reduce the production of um, expanded spectrum beta lactamase cephalosporins and fungal colonizations. So initial, initial empirical treatment of e, uh, EOS infection should consist of ampicillin ammonoglycid as we have already discussed with third or fourth uh, generation cephalosporins and uh, which has to be reserved only for the gram-negative meningitis. So don't directly, in any of the unit, don't directly go with Chempon with Cephotaxin if there is no clear picture of evidence of uh, growth in your unit. Start with an initially with the penicillins and amino acid combination. If you suspect and if you have a clear uh, cut protocol that your unit is growing uh, gram-negative uh, organism which is sensitive to the cephalosporins, then go ahead with the cephalosporins. This combination will be effective against GBS, most of the streptococcal, intercocal, and lysidia monocytes. Whatever the uh, initial thing which we have discussed, that is penicillins with uh, amino glycosides, most of the bacteria will be sensitive to uh, those combinations. Uh, treatment with piperacillin tazobactam or ampicillin salbactam is being is increasing among infants admitted to the hospital in NICU. However, the penetration of tazobactam to the CNS, if you're suspecting to the meningitis, go with the cefotaxim compared with the uh, piperacillin tazobactam because it's a penetration towards uh, central nervous system is unreliable and should not be used in the treatment for meningitis. So we started our empirical antibiotics based upon the unit protocol or based upon the uh, uh, empirical, whichever the protocol we follow. Then when to upgrade? Empirical upgradation can be done if we the if the expected clinical improvement with ongoing line of antibiotics does not occur. At least we need to give 40 to 70 hours period for observation should be allowed before getting uh, before declaring the particular line of antibiotics has been failed. Next thing is if the clinical worsening, then we need to obviously we need to think about updating of the antibiotics. Antibiotic stewardship. Why antibiotic stewardship is now ongoing uh, theme or ongoing uh, debate is going on antibiotic stewardship is we, as um, antibi uh, antibiotics which we have are less, organisms which have more and all the organisms are even smarter than the antibiotics which we have, where they're getting uh, too much of resistance for all the antibiotics which we have. If the so towards antibiotic stewardship, 
few points to be kept in mind. If the organism is sensitive to an antibiotic, so if you start an antibiotic and then um, you get a blood culture, if it is sensitive to a narrow spectrum or lower cost antibiotic, switch down. There is nothing wrong to switch down antibiotics if it is susceptible to that of the antibiotic which you have. So, uh, so don't uh, rethink or don't be so suspicious to switching down of the antibiotics as we upgrade. The same way thing, we should think about switching down also in the same way. If a possibly single sensitive antibiotic must be used, except in case of pseudomonas where two sensitive antibiotics should be used. If the empirical antibiotics are reported sensi sensitive, but the neonate has worsened on these antibiotics, it may be in case of in vitro resistance. Antibiotics may be changed to an alternative sensitive antibiotic with narrowest spectrum or a lower cost. Uh, if the antibiotic, empirical antibiotics, whichever we have started are resistant, but the neonate has improved clinically. So, so we are seeing that this baby, this uh, antibiotic is resistant, but the neonate is clinically, so of all which is important is clinical, clinical improvement. Improved clinically, it may or may not, uh, may not be a case of in vivo sensitivity. In such cases, careful assessment must be made before deciding about uh, empirical antibiotic, which is continuing of the empirical antibiotics. One must not uh, continue with any uh, with antibiotic with in vitro resistance in case of pseudomonas or Klebsiella or MRSA or in case of CNS infections or deep-seated infections. If no antibiotic has been reported sensitivity, but one or more has been reported moderately sensitive, that intermediate sensitivity is seen, there must be change in such antibiotic at the highest permissible dose. Uh, then think about the MIC value. Then uh, if you can think about the MIC, MIC, MIC value and then start on uh, intermediate sensitivity, or you can think about combination of the antibiotics, which is uh, that symbiotic relationship, which helps us to uh, clear that organism. So started on antibiotics, next how many days of antibiotics to be given. For the culture positive sepsis, yes, total duration should be 10 to 14 days. If a culture negative sepsis, the blood culture is reported sterile at 48 hours, then think to when to start, when to stop antibiotics, asymptomatic neonate with risk of UAS, top of antibiotics. Suspected UAS or LOAS on the neonate becomes completely asymptomatic over time, then you stop antibiotics. And mainly then you should take a... a all depends upon the clinical condition of the baby to stop antibiotics if the culture negative. So um, uh, the recent ones which have uh, shown that a short course of antibiotic that is uh, one or two days versus seven day course of intravenous uh, antibiotics for a probable sepsis. So a short course was a seven day course in a probable neonatal sepsis. There is no difference in the treatment failure rates could be uh, identified between the short course and seven day course. So if the baby is clinically improved and if there is then uh, uh, culture negative sepsis with there is uh, clinical improvement, so don't uh, wait, don't, don't give about seven to 10 days only for us. It is about, there is no much of evidence which is showing that seven day course or 10 day course is uh, having a good treatment than the uh, short course. So this is one of the proof of it, out of it. Next panel is meningitis. Uh, Gramstein proven meningitis or CSF uh, meningitis suspecting CSF examination should go with a total course of 21 days. While in case of meningitis, what are things to be monitored in a baby? At least twice a weekly head circumference to be monitored to see for the hydrocephalus and uh, to monitor for SIDH, that is IO chart to be seen, daily neurological examination and hearing screening to be done at 44 to 8 weeks of gestation. Ultrasound neurosonogram should, should be done um, in the first week. And then uh, look for the ventricular size and keep monitoring for the ventricular size for the hydrocephalus and uh, shift of ventricular midline shift or intraventricular debris. Ventriculitis, if we suspect of ventriculitis, give antibiotics for six weeks. Then finally, CECT uh, may be required in case of a rapidly rising. If the head circumference is, we are monitoring weekly heads, uh, twice weekly head circumference. If the OFC is uh, increasing rapidly, go ahead have for the CECT and then uh, see for the hydrocephalus. UTI, so how many days of antibiotics to be given for the UTI? Culture positive UTI should be treated for 14 days. Uh, uh, empirical treatment for if you're suspecting of UTI is uh, cefotaxime or ceftriaxone plus amikacin and modify as per the cultural report. Next, antibiotic resistance. I was, as I was mentioning previously, antibiotic resistance in nosocomial pathogens. There are so many uh, antibiotic resistance has de developed. That is invasive infection due to extended spectrum beta lactamases is producing uh, enterobacterial species, that is ESBL. In this case, avoid beta lactam containing antibiotics combined with beta lactamase inhibitors or quinolones. That is, carbapenem treatment, although the use of uh, cefepime could be considered. MRSA, think about giving vancomycin or linazolid. 
Vancomycin resistant enterococci, we have we can give daptomycin or ticoplanin. Carbapenem crab, that is carbapenem resistant acetobacter, think about giving cholestine and tigicycline. Clindamycin, ampicillin, sulbactam, or metronosol appropriate for anaerobic uh, infections. Metrosin is more preferable in anaerobic infections involving the CNS. So after antibodies, what are the other, other treatment modalities available for sepsis are adjuvant therapies, that is intravenous immunoglobulins. Intravenous immunoglobulins, so the recent study, which is International Neonatal uh, Immunotherapy Study, there is no significant uh, group difference between the rate of death or major disability two years of age using intravenous immunoglobulins. So uh, there is more negative than the positive in this. So granulocyte uh, micro GMCSF, there is granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor or granulocyte colony stimulating factor, which reduces the mortality in neonatal sepsis. Um, this does not exactly reduce the mortality in neonatal sepsis, but in case of neutropenic babies, it has a significant reduction in the mortality. It's more helpful in the neutropenic babies, where there is significant reduction in the mortalities. Next, exchange transmission, no significant redu reduction in the mortality, but it is uh, recommended in uh, uh, babies who are deteriorating with uh, deteriorating sepsis with sclerema, yes, it can be uh, think about exchange transmission. Other things like pentoxifeline, which is an uh, agent that improves the microcirculation, decrease the tumor necrosis factor alpha concentration associated with the sepsis. Two randomized end trials contains 140 units suggested that there were improvement in the survival rates of this uh, pentoxifeline who had cultured confirmed sepsis, who receives pentoxifeline. But still, at two, uh, we, uh, at, we should have a uh, uh, few more evidence to support the pentoxifeline. Next, finally, yes, of all this thing, we know prevention is better than the cure. Prevention of sepsis, which is um, every day, every unit, every person in the NICU will be keep talking about prevention of sepsis, prevention of sepsis. So how do we prevent sepsis? Uh, we can divide by the prevention of sepsis in three categories, that is antenatal, natal, and postnatal. Antenatally, maternal nutrition, maternal health, and vaccination with uh, tetanus, flu vaccine, this will help in reduction. Natally clean delivery practices like uh, sterile uh, PV examinations and if there is suspension of chorioamnitis, intrapartum antibiotics is very, very, very important. This will prevent neonatal sepsis. Postnatally, which is in our hands is hand washing and which is the single most uh, prevention which we keep talking that is hand washing. And few studies have proven that 2% of prolexin uh, skin application can uh, decrease the sepsis. Prompt removal of the unnecessary catheters. Keep on giving IV lines, keep on continuing the IV lines, even we are not giving anything through the IV line, will increase the rate of the sepsis. Umbilical stump chlorexidine infused studies has uh, proven that there is an useful for the prevention of sepsis. And non specific benefits for BCG. Mm. There are very, very few studies which uh, support that there are non specific benefits with BCG in a preterm babies and even with the coronavirus, which we have recently seen. Uh, the other three things is KMC. Uh, Kangara mother care, yes, 36% of lower mortality decrease the risk of sepsis in these uh, Kangara mother care babies. Probiotics, yes, probiotic which contains lactobacillus and bifidobacterium will decrease the rate of sepsis. And early enteral feeding. Anti infective properties of human milk will, will help this uh, early enteral feeding or uh, men, minimal enteral nutrition will help to decrease the sepsis. Uh, so, probiotics, as we have already discussed, this will increase the intestinal mucosal barrier to prevent the translocation of bacteria, so which will increase immunoglobulin A for the mucosal response, will ultimately decrease the uh, sepsis. And uh, enteral trophic feeding, yes, this will increase the gut maturity, increase the exploration of healthy gut microflora, which ultimately increase the gut uh, mucosal immunity and then decreases the sepsis. Um, and, and final thing is uh, early antibiotic exposure versus late, I mean, adverse outcome in the preterm and very low birth weight based baby, babies, that is continuing giving antibiotics, like early antibiotic. When we don't go to this protocol based or an approach based, we keep starting antibiotic for everyone. What will happen? That is after controlling of severity of illness, each day of antibiotic therapy provide a preterm, very low birth weight infants in the first two weeks of age so with the increased risk of late onset. Even giving the uh, antibiotic in the first two weeks, it will increase the risk of late onset sepsis, NEC or death unnecessary. Thank you. Uh, any questions or queries? Uh, Dr. Sindhu, till now, we haven't got any question in the group. And I believe the way you have taken the cases and you have explained step by step, I don't think anybody will be having questions. It was a very crisp and a very uh, easy presentation of a very difficult topic. I should must admit this that the way you have taken care of all the smallest uh, aspects 
of having new interceptions is, is really incredible work done. In case anybody is having question, you can put it on the group or you can share it with me. Yes. I will share it with Dr. Sindhu. Yes, sir. Uh, hope no other questions, mm -hmm. sir. Hope you have, uh, I mean, either they would have understood clearly or <laughs> they didn't. They didn't get any point. Um, so, 